I'm Catherine Goldman Schuyler, and this is Exploring Leadership. In this series of conversations, I'll introduce you to leaders who dance with possibility, whose creativity, depth, and vision bring leadership to life. People from many arenas, business, the arts, government, whose lives add vitality and meaning to our planet. Ed, I'm delighted to be here today to chat with you and with you, Peter. Ed, you have written so many books that have had such influence over many decades, and you've practically created the fields of organizational culture. I don't know if you created or shifted how people look at careers and also process cons consultation. Now you're looking at humble it's kind of humble everything, humble inquiry, humble consulting, humble leadership. Tell me about this focus and why now? I, I thought about this question and I think the answer has to be historical. It has several components. Component one is that I came out of graduate school with both psychology, sociology, and anthropology and always tried to look at everything from all three points of view. Then when I was in my first job, my first mentor, Douglas McGregor, influenced two of the important things that are operating today. One, he wanted me to see what a psychologist, sociologist would do with management rather than hiring yet another management guru. So all through the years, I've been an outsider looking at this field of leadership and management. And then other, he, the other influence from him was to be positive about people, to believe in people. The theory X, theory Y was always very important to me. And that led me to being sort of a practical humanist. I care very much for people but not just to be nice on, on general principle, but because being nice to each other, hearing each other, being able to talk to each other is the only way we get anything done. And that leads to the present where I realize that the field of leadership has become very complicated because of the complexity of the tasks that people face. And I learned this primarily from uh, tracking Peter in his career uh, in Silicon Valley. So it was very natural for us to hook up and decide to write a, a book called Humble Leadership that picks up these humanistic, pragmatic, multi-social science themes in the cauldron of new kinds of work that are going on in Silicon Valley with new kinds of people so I welcome Peter into this uh, co-authorship and uh, think we're being more topical now than, than I was before. Fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about you, Peter, and your relationship, the two of you, because that seems to relate to one part of what you're seeing as important in relation to leadership, the notion of people, of personization. So that's what led you to bring Peter in. I want to hear from both of you what it's like bringing your son in with his diverse experiences and being your son, and from you, Peter, what it's like working alongside Ed with the breadth and depth that he has in the field. <laughs> Where should we start? Well, first of all, I didn't bring him in. Okay. So, Peter, well, how did you show well, it, up? Well, it was, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, sort of living my life, my career in Silicon Valley, um, and uh, was doing a number of consulting projects where I could have really sort of done anything I wanted, and an opportunity came along to sort of, uh, to work with Ed, and the, the, really the issue was that um, 
we had spent so much time over the last decade kind of exchanging stories that we, you know, where, where there were themes that were resonating. And um, so we said, well, we probably need to, um, we need to get this down on paper. We need to, to start writing it up and um, seeing how we can sort of organize it. Uh, and the idea of uh, humility um, in, in, a, in an increasingly complex world uh, became sort of the centerpiece of, of this work together. Um, but a lot of it really was about storytelling, too. We both felt like we had read some really important stories that we wanted to assimilate into our work and also had our own stories that we realized were, were um, had great common themes. And um, so that's what humble, humble Leadership is about. It's a, it's a number of stories that um, suggest other ways of thinking about leadership. Any, how was this for you, Ed? Was that your experience or what would you add? For me to have Peter basically enter my intellectual bubble and say, hey, Dad, let's work on this together, was a pure, joyful gift. You know, I couldn't have asked for anything better out here. I came out here uh, after my wife died now, almost nine years ago, and was doing a lot of writing memoirs and so on, but I wasn't really turned on by anything in particular until Peter and I started to work together and this humble leadership book kind of created itself. It was a logical sequence to having written this humble inquiry book, but I really was ready to write a leadership book, but didn't really have enough material without not just Peter's own experience, but also broadening it to his children, my other grandchildren and thinking about leadership in futuristic terms where what young people will be facing is so totally different and where humility in all sorts of ways in the context of what we're calling here and now humility, seeing that we're up against very tough problems these days. And the only way to solve them is in groups and uh, learning how to take each other seriously, learning how to get to know each other. And Peter and I have practiced that with each other as we're learning how to write together. One of the things that I resonate with and what each of you has said, one thing is you're bringing time in, Ed. There has been increasing interest, I think, in the world of leadership of looking at longer time frames than we tend to look at, and certainly than businesses tend to look at. And you mentioned storytelling, and there's some fascinating work that's being done now to reframe and bring in more narrative and storytelling into the field of leadership. Well, I, I find it interesting that you say now, because it seems to me storytelling has always been <clears throat> historically one of the best ways to communicate social science knowledge. I, I've grown quite cynical about <clears throat> the way in which the field of leadership has become a batch of silos, all the way from people who can only imagine it in terms of huge correlational studies between some arcane bit of behavior and some arcane output measure and finding some low level, almost meaningful, cor meaningless correlations versus telling a good story about what leadership is really all about, how diffuse it is, how complex it is. Uh, stories can bring in the complexities whereas the formal research that particularly the psychologists have adopted, uh, I'm quite impatient with because you can see the correlations, but you can't make any sense of the results, what it all means. At some level, it seems to me that 
writing about leadership needs to perhaps bridge that range from something that is research, that's really giving us some knowledge and that also inspires people and gives hope. I think your book, the stories that you brought in in the book intrigued me since you covered the range from government in Singapore, another part of the world, to healthcare, to the military in the US, areas people don't usually connect. Um, tell us a little bit about how you, about those stories and why you chose them and what they, you feel they bring to the book. Because for me, that was what was most exciting about the book were those three stories. Stories started with really Douglas McGregor. He was a researcher, but he was a clinician and clinicians do research. And he told stories about his experiences as a college president, uh, his observations of what makes for a good manager, uh, being much more of a, uh, a believer in human behavior and a bad manager being a cynic about humans. He had stories illustrating all this. And I think he influenced me to a statement I've often made that in this field, we're at the Darwinian age. We're still observing and trying to make sense of what we observe. We don't have clean cut variables around which to do research. So the research has to be observational and storytelling until somewhere along the line, it'll make some sense to somebody, but I don't believe we're at that stage yet. It doesn't yet make it fall into any neat categories that a researcher could then put numbers on. The, the common theme, too, with what's common to all of those stories is that we're describing situations where leaders saw the benefits of establishing personal connections with the people that work with them. Um, so that happened in Singapore. It happened in startups in Silicon Valley. It's, it happened in the military. It's particularly, um, you know, as we note, some of the most powerful stories came out of the military. You know, the, the, the largest hierarchy on the planet. But we, uh, you know, we, we saw that as, as um, uh, really sort of powerful examples that crossed, you know, these different sectors um, of this process that we describe in the book as personization. Let me just say some things about personization, what we're really after here. <coughs> I think when you look at relationships between people, they can be very transactional where I relate to you in your role as a customer or as a boss or as, as a fellow uh, from another department and what we realize is that personization means to go beyond the role and see the whole person in the role. And when you think of the whole person, you realize it unlocks communication. If I just deal with you transactionally, we're each going to just say what's appropriate to our role. Uh, the very formal doctor-patient relationship. When the doctor gets to know the patient as a patient, he, he or she often discovers that all kinds of new data come out that makes for a better diagnosis that the patient wasn't prepared to talk about because he or she thought it wasn't appropriate to the role. So personization is getting past that transactional stage in communication and saying, I need to get to know you. How do we do it? The subordinate walks into the boss's office, notices that there's a picture of a family on the boss's desk, walks over the picture and says to the boss with a big smile, is that your family? That immediately forces personalization. Now the boss may reject it and say, no, we, we're not gonna talk about that and go back in the role but some bosses might say, okay, yeah, and start talking about their family. And before you know it, 
they're in a much better relationship than if the subordinate had just stood like a good soldier waiting for the boss to say something. Reading the book, I noticed two things that are, seem very related. One is how important it is for the top person to have that kind of relationship with people and then to support other people doing that. And the other was a statement, I think, in a box that said, when there isn't support, it can't happen. What does it take? I know that we could then say, well, what it takes is support from the top, but that's too simple, right? What does it take for there to be more of this kind of leadership in the world today? We're certainly struggling seeing leadership going in all directions. I think the short answer is a person in a leadership position has to discover that as long as he or she remains transactional, they're not getting information, they're not getting help, they're not able to solve problems. It's going to be a pragmatic issue for leaders of the future to realize that to solve complex problems, you do need help. That's where the humility comes in. And you do need information. And that information and help isn't going to come across a boundary that officially is supposed to be distant. Professional distance is supposedly a good thing. And in fact, professional distance just prevents good communication when you want to put it in very simple terms. So in other words, what the companies and their leaders or governments or any large organization wants is for that organization to be able to do something really well. And you're saying that without personalization, it hampers success in what you're trying to do. Yes, I think that's a good way of putting it. So it, I, I was actually seeing it in a more limited way as a value for human beings. But what I'm hearing now is both a valuing of human beings as, as whole people and also seeing how it is that that's important from the business or government or effectiveness standpoint. I think that's a very key point because as I think about my whole history, <clears throat> I've always struggled with the values of organization development, the values of our field, because it never seemed to me that the values should be the primary focus. It always seemed to me that getting the job done better, being more effective, doing important things was the real value. And in order to do that, you had to be in a certain way humanistic. You had to value people. You had to value communication. Not for its own sake. It's not about being nice. It's about being effective. And I think the field of OD is still confused about that. We still don't know, should we be a humanistic field and, and say, you know, life is better if we're all nicer to each other? Or should we concentrate on getting things done that society and groups and all of us need to be done more effectively and discovering in that process that we have to be more connected, we have to be more personal with each other, or we won't be able to solve those problems. It's a very important point. How about the field of leadership as a field? Can you see things that perhaps an organization like the ILA can do that would make even more of a difference than it is in the context you're speaking of? The problem may well be that leadership is indeed a set of silos rather than a field. And it depends a lot on whether you take leadership as a characteristic of people and turn it into a a personality thing, or whether you take it as a group phenomenon that surfaces unpredictably and historically, uh, we, we never know for sure 
whether the the Napoleons create history or history has created the Napoleons. And we haven't yet figured out how to have a good theory that, that really deals with the true interaction. Because the historians find it easier, of course, to talk about the individuals. But in reality, I see leadership as a messy mismatch of all kinds of theories and value statements and what it should be, what it shouldn't be. Uh, and I don't think we've sorted it out at all. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I've seen with, um, with my kids and also with their cousins is this, this sort of bright line between the experience that, that they have um, working in a big organization um, in a training program, in a leadership program, in a big organization, um, versus working in a 15-person startup. And um, what's interesting to me is that I think um, they're learning more in these um, small, organic, adaptive, fast-paced startups about leadership than they would at um, in a training program in a, you know, in a... I think those programs are great, but it's been interesting to me to see what they learn in small companies that are continually pivoting and continually adapting to a rapidly changing environment. Um, that's the world that we see, and I think that's the world that they're going to inherit, if not make, because they too see the, the, the value of, of um, being you know, having a sort of an organic model of how organizations should be run as opposed to a hierarchical model. And um, I think the other thing that, that at the end of the day we, we learn from all of these 20-somethings is it's way more fun to work in environments like that. So um, one way or the other, leaders need to create those safe spaces for young people to uh, enjoy their work. And one of the basic points of the Humble Leadership book is that if people do establish personal relationships um, and trust and openness, they'll enjoy their work more. They won't go uh, into work feeling like, you know, uh, what horrible thing is going to happen to them? What, you know, what, what's the boss going to do today? They're going to feel like they're working with people, not for people. So I know some young people who have been in that kind of situation and helped to create a startup and felt they were working with people. And then in order to get further funding for the startup, the nature of the business had to change and they had to start laying off the people they brought in as a team. So it can be very disheartening, too, to be in these smaller businesses and face situations that they often face. Yes, I've, that's true. I've been in a couple of those myself. And it's, at some level, it is very important for young people to go through that, to gain that perspective. It hurts. It's, um, it's painful. But I think the other thing that, that we have to accept is that... Um, the the venture community doesn't necessarily yet accept what we're talking about in humble leadership. You mentioned earlier that um, it, part of this message is taking a longer view and letting the team uh, and the and the groups within these small organizations figure that out themselves um, uh, where they need to go. But you know, the, oftentimes the uh, you know, the pressure of, of the quarter, of the, you know, the budget, um, uh, the, you know, the importance of selling something uh, um, gets in the way of really thinking about what's the adaptation that we need to make in as, organ as an organization to be successful. Um, I, I want to add a point to that. <clears throat> Let's just take... Uh, layoffs and shrinking and compare which we would prefer to be an employee who is now laid off in the startup because it's run out of money 
or to be an employee in General Electric and have a pink slip arrive and saying, your unit has been closed down, goodbye. Which is the better training and learning experience? I think what the big corporations have learned to do is humanistically evil. And what the young person in the startup learns is it's, it's cruel and I hate it and I wish this had worked, but I understand it. We ran out of money. What a difference between that realization and being in a big corporation and, and he even having as the movie Up in the Air illustrates the companies hiring impersonal people to do the firing. That's evil on a humanistic scale. And so I have little sympathy for the cruelty of the big corporation uh, because I think it's much worse than the trauma of the startup. Actually, what got me into leadership roles in my own career when I was younger was that my first job was eliminated by people who didn't intend to eliminate it. I was having lunch, it was at a community college, and I was having lunch with, I don't know if he was a VP or a campus director, but you know, he was somewhere high up in the hierarchy. And I told him my job had just been eliminated. And he looked at me across the table because we were friends. There was definitely a person relationship. And he said, was that your job? He had no idea. <laughs> they didn't know they were eliminating my job. And fortunately, the way it was eliminated, I still had another role. It was eliminated for like the following term or something like that. And I was able to find a role that was different than the role I'd been in and somehow convince them that I fitted. And then I was able to create uh, a whole program after that. So really being jolted like that did lead me to being creative about creating things in the world rather than waiting for positions that existed. I want to shift slightly looking at another dynamic of what you brought up, which is the relationship between what people seem to need or want and what kind of leadership we get. I'm fascinated by the way that people are choosing and electing leaders or supporting leaders that seem to be quite different than what we're trying to create, all three of us. It seems to relate to some kind of human needs, going back to what you said about psychologists. And I remember you did some writing on this around 2000, looking at healthy, a healthy world and healthy organizations. Do you want to comment a bit, Ed, about some of that? What is it that leads people to look for leaders that aren't really very humanistic or supporting? The, what, the, what I learned from all that research on career anchors is, first of all, that people want different things. And we're in jeopardy the minute we say everybody wants this. <laughs> Uh, the variety of what people want is huge. Secondly, it seems to me people don't know what they want until they get into the situation. So the career anchors emerged for most people after five to ten years of experience. They didn't know what they wanted until they tried different things, until they had different kinds of bosses. And I see that in, in, the, in my grandchildren. Uh, Two of them started in big companies uh, because they really thought that this, this corporate thing was, was a good thing. And within a year, discovered, no, 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 that's not what I want at all. Uh, I don't like the, the pace of the work. I don't like the way it's organized. Uh, as, as one of my uh, grandchildren put it, he looked up the hierarchy and said, I don't see anybody there whom I can admire. What a statement. So he went back to school and is now in a robotic startup. Uh, these emerging, uh, finding out who I am and what I need, is where sociologically I'm much more comfortable. Let, let people try things out. Let's not say, 
we need this kind of leader, we need that kind of leader, we need this kind of job. It's a very emergent uh, uh, dynamic process. It's a learning process. I'm very into learning these days, especially group learning. Uh, I think the world is, is so much uh, divided now into groups and groups fighting each other that the solution is not going to be at the individual leader level or at the individual follower level. It's going to be at the level of how can two groups that are constantly fighting with each other and not communicating, how can they form into something coherent? It's what our country is going through. It's what I see in every... When a manager complains about silos, it's his fault or her fault. It means they haven't created a climate where those groups can talk to each other. So I don't know whether I'm even remotely connected to the question you asked me, but I think we've got to think in, in broader dynamic group terms about this not in terms of leader personality or what followers want. One of the things that Ed talked a lot about in humble leadership, in humble inquiry, and we also touch on in, in humble leadership, is that we still are operating on a, a typically sort of American individualistic assumption about, about ourselves and our lives and our work. And um, a sort of basic premise of humble leadership is that you sort of have to step away from the mirror and think about going to work worried more about the people that you work with and a little bit less about yourself. And one argument we make is that that actually takes a little pressure off. You know, you, you, uh, you may find it easier to go to work if you're a little bit less worried about what you're doing that day and more worried about the success of the team that you're in. Um, but at the same time, it's clear that we do see national leaders around the world, um, you know, building their power by creating enemies, by saying it's us against them or it's we against them. And um, we, we comment in the book that that tribalism that we're all experiencing right now um, you know, maybe we're at, at sort of peak tribalism to, to, to borrow that phrase from the petroleum industry, the peak oil concept, that we've now reached a point where the tribalism that we're experiencing today, um, uh, we, we think is, is, uh, has, has reached its limit. We, we, we won't succeed if we continue to think in terms of everything's a zero-sum game, it's all about us winning and them losing. Um, we really, you know, and I, again, I think that's one thing that we see in some interesting startups is that they're more focused on um, their ecosystem than they are on beating their competitors. And that way of thinking about how organizations progress um, ultimately, uh, you know, makes, you know, makes them intrinsically more adaptable. Um, but also, you know, maybe better suited to the mindset um, of a lot of the young people that want to work in these organizations. They don't always want to be winning and losing. They want to be progressing and they want to be learning. That's very exciting to me that you're speaking about learning, you're speaking about ecosystems. So when I think back to my question about what the ILA as an organization can do, I am really seeing that that is one of, those are two of the foci that they're working with, is bringing about more of an ecosystem and a regenerative approach within leadership and really emphasizing the value of learning. I think the, the way in which the work of organizations is changing has to be factored in there. I mean, the, the technological changes of the last 25, 50 years are enormous. Uh, just the way the world is now interconnected, uh, everything is now public through, uh, through the media, uh, I think has created organic dynamisms 
across groups, across cultures uh, that we don't yet understand. And the current concepts, the traditional management culture theory is just plain obsolete for dealing with these fluid, shape-changing organizations that are operating all over the world, uh, where you have General McChrystal saying, team of teams, well, what does that even mean? Uh, in a society that doesn't know how to be team-oriented, we talk teams in the US, but we don't really know how to run teams, except in the military. The military is always emphasized leadership training and team building. That's why they often do better. But outside the military, I don't see us growing into uh, a set of models and theories that can take care of these very fluid, dynamic intergroup systems. I think that's a great close because it's really an opening. It's where things need to go. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Peter, for an inspiring conversation today. And thank you for having us.